Deep inside every one of us is a lion waiting to be unleashed. Are you ready to be unleashed into your destiny? As we stand on the edge of time, the web of deception is being unraveled. Carl Joseph offers you the red pill and the keys to unlock the shackles of your mind. Get ready to be transformed by God's supernatural power. Let's join him now. Friend, our topic today is the rapture of the church. Now, we believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, who is coming to receive his beloved bride in the air prior to the tribulation period, which is to come upon the earth. Friend, eight times in the New Testament, we are admonished to look for the soon return of Jesus Christ. However, at no time is the church instructed to look for the Antichrist. We are looking for Jesus, friend, not the Antichrist, because we, the church, will never see the Antichrist. We will, in fact, be long gone before he arrives upon the scene. So I hope you're not too disappointed about that. Isaiah chapter 24 describes the great and terrible day of the Lord, which the church was never meant to see. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, it describes how we, the church, will be delivered from God's wrath to come, which is this great and terrible time of tribulation. Now, I'm speaking to a very wide audience here on the radio, so I'm not sure how much end time study you've done down the years. But I must say that recently, this whole concept of God rescuing the church before the tribulation period, better known as the rapture, has come under a lot of attack lately. I will say right up front that the viewpoint of the church going through the tribulation is not the majority view amongst evangelicals or even Pentecostals. Lately, there has been a push toward the belief that if we don't endure God's wrath, which is the tribulation, that we are somehow cowardly or not willing to endure persecution. But this accusation is both unfair and unscriptural. Now, before I get ahead of myself, the English word rapture comes from the Latin word rapier, which means caught up. Now, Jerome, of course, translated the Bible from Greek into Latin, and the source of the English term rapture comes from a Latin source equivalent to the Greek term for being caught up. Some scholars also believe the Latin word for snatched is raptus, and is more likely the source for our term rapture. But anyway, the term caught up refers to the famous passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, and I'm reading it for you. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now the Greek word for caught up here is hapazo. This is the precise description of what will occur, friend. The church will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and received unto him before God's wrath is released upon this earth. It's important to remember that at the rapture, Christ comes for his saints. But in contrast, at his second coming, at the close of the tribulation period, Jesus comes with his saints. At the rapture, he comes in the air, but at his second coming, he comes to earth to rule in power and glory as king. Friend, without doubt, the rapture and second coming are two separate and distinct events, not to be confused with each other. Now, obviously, the term rapture cannot be found in the King James Bible because it stems from the Latin term for caught up, as I mentioned previously. But there are several other terms that are used within Orthodox Christianity that cannot be found in the Bible either. For example, the word trinity or second coming or demon or millennial reign, they're not found in the Bible either, friend although they're in popular usage today. So just don't get hung up on the fact that the word rapture is not found in the Bible. It's a key doctrine of Scripture and has been described as our catching away or gathering together or ingathering in the New Testament. So there are indeed many ways to describe this future event. In fact, there are actually 14 ways that it is described in the New Testament. It's called the appearing in Hebrews, the blessed hope in Titus, the catching away in 1 Thessalonians, the changing in 1 Corinthians, the gathering in 2 Thessalonians, the manifestation of the sons of God in Romans, the mercy in the book of Jude. It's called the receiving in 1 John. It's also called the redemption of our bodies in the book of Romans. It's also called the rescue or deliverance in the first chapter of Thessalonians, the escape in the book of Daniel, the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of 1 Peter, and finally the transformation in the book of Philippians. Friend, 
take my word for it, this imminent event we've coined the rapture in the modern vernacular is replete within the New Testament. Therefore, you should have no concern whether or not this is some whimsical doctrine that sprung up in the past few years because it has in fact been around since the early church fathers. Now, some people think the pre-tribulation view of the rapture was invented by a man called John Nelson Darby in the 1800s. Well, it's true, this man from Great Britain revived the pre-tribulational view of the rapture of the church, but it was certainly not his invention. In fact, if we look at the writings of the early church fathers, like the shepherd of Hermes, Victorinus, Cyprian, and Ephraim the Syrian, these men were all preachers of the pre-tribulation rapture, and this doctrine is nothing new. You see, friend, there are several mysteries concealed within God's Word which were ready to be revealed within the New Testament. For example, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 through 21, the church's birth is described as being hidden. Throughout the Old Testament, the existence of the church birthed at Pentecost is hard to find, although there are types and shadows alluding to it. The fact that the Gentiles would become a part of Abraham's blessing was also hidden and described in Galatians 3, verses 13 through 14. And finally, our topic today, the rapture of the church or catching away of believers, was also hidden and a mystery, but later revealed within the New Testament. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 52, the rapture is called a mystery for the first time. The second coming was certainly revealed, however, in the Old Testament several times, but the rapture really was. That's why this rapture is called a mystery. And let me read this passage to you now, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality mortality. When Paul uses this term sleep in this passage, friend, he means death, not sleep as we know it. Instead of dying, there are some of us who will be changed from corruptible to an incorruptible physical body of flesh and bone when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air in this rapture event. However, because Israel was disobedient, they will not see it. This rapture is the marker which ends the church age, and then God completes his unfinished business with Israel. The very purpose of the rapture is to remove God's beloved church, or the bride of Christ, ready to meet the bridegroom in the air, so that we may escape the tribulation period that is to come upon Israel because of their rejection of Christ as Savior. Seven times in the book of Revelation, it describes God's wrath being poured out in various ways, with vivid descriptive language like that of a wine press or the cup of the wine of his fierceness. Now, many people today fail to acknowledge that the rapture is indeed the blessed hope spoken of in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. This blessed hope is the assurance that we may escape the wrath of God, as I've mentioned. But throughout history, of course, the church has suffered millions of martyrs at the hands of wicked men who've persecuted it. Friend, although this may not be evident so much in the United States thus far, the wrath of Satan has definitely been poured out on the church for the past two millennia, resulting in the death of millions upon millions of Christians, and the tribulation period has not even started yet. Friend, the tribulation period is clearly documented in Scripture as the wrath of God, not Satan. And we haven't been appointed to God's wrath in Scripture. Only unbelievers are appointed to God's wrath. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, it says the wrath of God is appointed only for his enemies. In Ephesians 5, 6, it says the wrath of God is come upon the children of disobedience. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says that Jesus has delivered us, the church, from the wrath which is to come, talking about this tribulation period that's fast approaching. In Luke 21.36, Jesus warned his disciples they should watch and pray that they may be counted worthy to escape the tribulation period and stand before the Son of Man. In Romans 1.18, it says the wrath of God is revealed against the ungodly, not the church. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says that God has not appointed the righteous to his wrath. No, friend, the wrath of God, which is the tribulation period, is clearly for the unrighteous, the ungodly, and the sinner, but not us, the church. 
People who embrace the notion that it's somehow godly to endure God's wrath and venture into the tribulation period as a badge of honor either do not comprehend the love of the Father properly or fully ascertain the severity of God's judgments that will fall upon the earth in unrelenting cataclysm. I think it's fair to say, friend, that these Christians who desire to go through the trib have no real comprehension for just how awful or terrible it's going to be and have no scriptural justification as to why Christ's precious bride should have to endure the wrath of God the Father when it's already garbed in the robe of righteousness and made spotless by the blood of Jesus. Don't forget the words of Jesus himself speaking to the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3.10. He said, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Friend, this makes it very clear that the church will be absent for this terrible hour of temptation. The bottom line is this, friend. The Jews are instructed to flee God's wrath in Luke 3, 7, but we, the church, are going to escape it all together. So if there is a rapture, did Jesus speak of it himself? Yes, friend, he did. I'm glad you asked that. I'm reading from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, Jesus said he would gather us together unto himself, and this is the mystery spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 52, which is what I just read to you earlier. This is the mystery. It is the rapture. So what is the timing of the rapture exactly? When will it occur? Now, some scholars believe the book of Galatians is the first epistle that Paul wrote in 48 AD, but others contend that his first letter to the Thessalonians was his first epistle. This is significant because in every chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the rapture is mentioned, and I will get into this in more detail in future broadcasts. But regarding the timing of the rapture itself, our focus should be Romans chapters 9 through 11. These chapters describe the church age coming to fruition because of Israel's rejection of Christ as Savior. Because of their rejection, Israel is spiritually blind for a season until blindness is removed from their eyes as to the identity of the true Messiah. Once we, the church, are raptured, friend, Israel will no longer be blind. And this is the marker by which God's focus shall shift from the church to Israel once more within the tribulation period, better known as the time of Jacob's trouble. But until that time of tribulation, in this church age, we continue to preach the gospel in every nation and every tongue. Friend, this process will continue until the set number of believers that God has ordained to be in the body of Christ. Then and only then will the body be complete and the rapture finally occurs. When the fullness of the Gentiles is reached, then Christ will come that very second. Friend, I've thrown a lot of information to you today, and this is only my first part, as we continue to study the rapture of the church. It's an essential doctrine of the Bible. You've been listening to Carl Joseph and the Lions Unchained podcast. Carl is a minister who's witnessed God's supernatural power to save, heal, and deliver. Carl is a unique researcher who investigates current affairs, societal trends, technology, cults, and end-time events, all through a biblical lens. Every Monday, new podcasts are uploaded, so stay tuned for the next opportunity to roar into victory. Check out carljosephministries.com for exciting articles, teachings, and discussion points. See you next week, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button 